you know, he was going nuts then because they were shooting his tires out. He came here the night, the, the day they shot his tires out, or, or the one tire out. And, uh, you know, he came here, he said, John, I'm going to turn myself in. I said, Bob, there's nobody to turn yourself into. Now stop it, <laughs> you know. So these are the original Dulcie papers. They were written in pencil by Mr. X, who lives in Henderson. And the reason he uh, wrote them down was so that I could distribute them. And there's a page of information, and then there's the drawings here that you can see are of the lab, and the vats with the uh, human meat in it, and the test tubes growing the humans, and uh, different, this is, a, this is the womb <clears throat> with the different humans, and the different vats, and, and then where, did, where, where did these papers, the drawings, come from? Mr. X copied them from the photographs that Thomas Castillo gave to him to hide. Okay. Mr. X got one of the boxes. One of the boxes was hidden in the mountains near Dolan Springs, <clears throat> which is southeast of here on your way to Kingman. So the deal was they were after, oh, and then I took these, and what I did was typed it up and made these black and white drawings from the pencil drawing because you couldn't see the pencil drawings <clears throat> very clearly. So you see you have the vat here and uh, the little thing that comes down and says seems to keep water vibrated. Uh, it was an amber liquid and it gives the approximate dimensions. It says looks like large pieces of pale meat and cloudy waters submerged not floating. Each one of these is the description of one of the photos that uh, Castillo gave Mr. X. Uh, here's a picture of the cameras on the doorway to uh, scores of tanks or more. <clears throat> this is... <clears throat> now I forget, what happened to Thomas Castillo? I'm going to tell you. So here's a picture of... Uh, these wombs are hooked into machines. Wombs submerged in sort of yellow liquid looks thicker than water. And these humans are growing there. Uh, creatures float in amber-colored water. Womb is grayish globs of yellow, white in grooves. Uh, dozens of creatures in each womb. Can't count the tanks. Maybe scores or hundred. These wombs were two feet vertically and three to four feet uh, horizontally. Uh, these creatures uh, wait, wait, wait. Sorry. It's just, I'm having problems here. Okay, go, keep going because... No, 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 no. We're okay. I've got two cameras on him, huh? It doesn't matter. You've got all that. Not a problem. Right. Thank you, Uh The creatures, if you took them out of this womb, would, here's a... a uh, what it would look like if they placed you placed them in your hands. They have three fingers, two toes. They're not human. The color is wrong. Looks blue gray. They have a very thin skin, and they're about six inches high. Um, these are what the the uh, test tubes look like. Um, the room light was pink purple, bright in some areas. Hundreds of these various stages of growth. In other words, these tubes, these things that growing here are in various stages of growth. Wispy hair, uh, not quite a nose, the mouth looks sealed, uh, the womb looks gray, um, veins look dark gray creature, um, uh, white pale eyes, dark lids, can't find a gender, two toes, three fingers, uh, liquid amber color, not completely clear, Looks like the glass tube is about five foot high. Then these, this is various information. We don't know what that is, but that was in the papers. So Castillo took, or Costello took, uh, made six of these, five or six of these waterproof, uh, wrapped in plastic uh, containers. And they had uh, 25 black white, black and white photos, a videotape with no dialogue, and a set of papers that included technical information 
of the uh, alleged jointly occupied uh, U.S. alien facility one kilometer beneath the Archuleta Mesa near Dulce, New Mexico. Several persons were given the above package to hold for safekeeping. Uh, most of those given the package were shown what the package contained but were not technically oriented uh, or knew very little about what they were looking at. Uh, so Mr. X was given one, hid it, and uh, the deal was Thomas was on the run and Dulce or any of those other operations send out bounty hunters and these are like bikers or stuff that, that go find somebody for money and they're very serious about their occupation and usually it doesn't take very long to go get somebody. But anyway, Thomas told Mr. X, if I, I'm going to be here every four months just to show you that I'm alive or I'll be in contact. If I miss two four-month contacts or eight months, two in a row, then you can release these papers. So this all happened in 1987. And I think 1993 or 94 was when uh, Costello missed, missed his uh, connections. In other words, he missed the, com the contact at the first six, uh, four months and the second at eight months. <clears throat> so it was decided to go and get, and get the box. I didn't go myself, but I believe Bill Hamilton did. I think he was one of them. And I think Tal was another one. But I'm not sure. I don't remember. It's been, you know, it was 20 years ago, and I don't remember. But I do remember that it was a serious effort that they made at least six expeditions in to find this uh, box, and it was never found. It's just and at the top of the mountain. It wasn't at the top. It was. It was. I don't think it was at the top. It was hidden about halfway up. Oh, but like I said, there was like a spell or a black magic, you know, some kind of spell cast on that whole area around the box. <clears throat> it could have been. I do know that uh, there is nothing secret that any of us do. We're always on film or video or some kind of camera. Have been for forty years. There's absolutely nothing we can hide. Nothing we think or say or do is secret. Uh, Meaning so, you guys are surveilled because you were involved? No, everybody, every person on the face of the earth. Oh. <laughs> right. There's nothing that anybody does in secret. Um, and uh, the Navy, you know, some of the stuff that Linda Howe came out with, as a matter of fact, I had a chance to talk with her the other day. Um, she had found some papers in her garage uh, that looked pretty technical. <clears throat> and she said they had got, she had got them in the late 80s, but she had never read them. And so now that she had taken the time to read them, she thought they had a lot of value and, uh, and were they mine? And I said, no, they don't sound like mine. And she said, okay, well, I'm going to post them. So she posted them on her website and um, uh, somebody on ATS says, hey, man, or you got to look at this. Or it was maybe not on ATS. I think it was gone by then. It was somebody like on Open Minds. And I said, okay, I'll take a look. So I went over there. <clears throat> and it was, you know, you have to pay um, dues or, you know, you have to pay right. a fee to get on her stuff. So I couldn't get in. So I wrote her and I said, Linda, I'm a little <laughs> short at this time. Can you uh, let me look at them? I never heard from her. So I got somebody to uh, download it and I read it all. And it w all it was was stuff that me and Tal and everybody else in the industry, somebody had taken all that and put it together like it was one big, you know, document. Oh, okay. All of our stuff. And there were some hidden uh, phrases. The one, the one I remember specifically was talking about a former attorney general in Nevada named um, uh, Brian. Uh, and I forget what his first name was. His last name was Brian. And it was spelled uh, B-R-I-A-N. And his real name is B-R-Y-A-N. For some odd reason, I had the capacity to recall stuff that happened, you know, 50 years ago, exactly, and I don't know what, what it is, you know, but I can recall stuff I read, stuff, you know, people I talked to, you know, and, and anything to do with this, it's instant, and I don't know how it works, because there's a lot of other stuff I don't remember. Huh. But wow. stuff like reading, I can take that document, read right through it, and say, no, I know who wrote each one of these, you know, <laughs> and, and recall that. That's so, great. <clears throat> the document that she had 
Uh, was was not not secret so at all. So the box was never found. What about the other? I don't know six boxes. Each one was given to a friend, and each one, and none of them was found. Okay. So that's pretty much the end of the Dulcy story. It comes up every once in a while. What about Mark Richards? Have you ever heard of him? He's the guy who. Well, he's a guy who said he was a security guard who is in prison right now for another. You know, it's like a setup. He says it's set up for murder. His wife, total, Joanne, I guess, is out. Total unadulterated bullshit. Really? And that's from three of us who have researched that story backwards, forwards, upside down. That's the, the dark of the moon or something like that. I mean, it was crazy. When I started to read that, I actually paid for it. I sent, you know, actually paid real money for that story. <clears throat> and, you know, because he says he was a test pilot for my father and <clears throat> back in the 40, uh, back in the late 40s. And, and that would have fit because, you know, the, he did use test pilots back in then. And, and some of it sounded pretty interesting. But then when I read the, uh, the attack on Dulcie and, you know, the attack, the, the Dulcie story, the, the fight, what we call the Dulcie War, not a war at all. What happened is they were in this, this is like in the late, 70s, I think it was, 79, um, the gray, one gray was giving a class to about 40 U.S. scientists, and it was at Los Alamos, or um, Dulce, and he, it was just a class, and guards, our guards, the Delta Force, were advised that they were not allowed to go into a classroom with a gray, or approach a gray, or be anywhere near a gray, with a firearm of any sort. And so whatever reason, uh, this security guard walked into this instructional class with a weapon and the um, gray killed him instantly. I mean, there was no warning, no nothing, just killed him instantly. Wow. And so the Delta Force um, who were watching it on the monitor went in force to get you know, to, to take revenge on something they had um, witnessed. And when it was all said and done, there was uh, 66 people killed, and included all the scientists and all the Delta Force. Now... By the one gray. By the one gray. So I had heard this story, <clears throat> and uh, when Bob was at S4, he read the identical story, he heard the word Dulce, the only difference between the document, the briefing he read on the, on the massacre was that it occurred at Area 51. And the only possible explanation that I have for that is his clearance hadn't advanced high enough for him to know about Dulcie. Mm. Because okay. it didn't happen at Area 51, it happened at Dulcie. But he did read the whole description. And he talks about that. Uh, maybe we'll have time. Uh, there's a videotape over there called the Bob Chronicles and very few people have seen it and what it was was when Bob decided not to go back to work at the test site and uh, and he was you know he was going nuts then because they were shooting his tires out he came here the night the, the day they shot his tires out or, or the one tire out and uh, you know he came here he said John I'm gonna turn myself in I said Bob there's nobody to turn yourself into now stop it <laughs> you know and so he slept on the couch that night, and um, um, I lost my train of thought there. He slept on the couch. Um, what was they talking about, right? Well, that we were talking about well, um, his having seen these documents. He wasn't clear to know about Dulcie, but he oh, yeah. was about the firefight. But you're uh, saying, no, but you were saying this tape, this, the tape that he recorded. The oh, the tape of the Bob Chronicles. Seen. So anyway, um, right after that, uh, George Knapp, went in and did an hour interview over at his house and uh, to get everything on tape that he could possibly tell us so that if they did kill him that at least we'd have that uh, and that was before we made the uh, you know the Lazar tape the Lazar tape you know it took three or four months to do you know and then that was a professional one but what George wanted to do was was get the the meat of the information right now so, so you're that saying we had you it. have that yeah it was right there I gave it to uh, Ron um, Run um, <clears throat> Garner. Garner, the other day to to put it on DVD. Did you? Mm -hmm. Is he going to try to sell it? 
I don't think so. I told him, no, it's, it's, uh, we tried to get it. I talked to George about it and he said, no, technically it belongs to Channel 8, so he can't do anything with it. I said, okay, I don't, I just show it to friends, you know, to say Yeah, that, we'd love to see it. Sure. That'd be great. So, in a no. few minutes here, we'll take a little break and I'll yeah. show that. I'd like to ask you how that dovetails into Phil Schneider's story. The well, you know, Phil's a great guy. I've met him on several occasions. It's a great story. I think there's aspects of Phil Schneider's uh, story that are true, but I don't think the Dulce is, and I don't think he was in a Dulce firefight. Because hmm. everybody got killed there. And, and well, Phil's isn't it possible there's more than one? Firefights? Yeah. Possible, but Bob only read one. And the guys that I've talked to, <clears throat> a few minutes ago, we were talking about the insiders. Uh, that I had met. And then the one insider I told you about um, that told me about building the, the mine, piece of mining equipment that was so huge and he doesn't know how it went to the moon, um, he talked about Dulce and he said that um, he knew it as Section D and there's other people that know it as Section D and not Dulce. Okay. Um, uh, that guy specifically, he was the, the insider. When I talk about an insider, this was, guy was on the inside. And he said, you know, he told me stuff I hadn't heard before. For instance, I'd always heard that we'd been to the moon earlier than 1969. He says, yeah, we were there in 62. We were on Mars in 66. He, wow. was, he was the one that told me uh, about the fourth astronaut being killed in Apollo 1 because he was there two hours later. They sent him specifically, and he didn't say why they called for him or what he did. But he said that instantaneously, as the fire was going out, <clears throat> NSA, who controls everything there, it's not NASA, it's a national security agency, they locked down the whole area. and Nobody moved while they went in there, NSA guys, and removed that body. They had to, you know take Grissom and Chaffee and White and get that guy because where he was sitting was down by the um, uh, the environmental control unit and I'll show you what the Apollo module looks like because when you first start talking about a fourth guy that oh there's no room I've seen it in a museum well there's plenty of room down there because that's where they stored the moon rocks and uh, we're, we're gonna store the moon rocks and the guy would stick his feet there and lay his head up on the instrument panel and the astronauts would be laying this way and he'd be laying that way. <clears throat> and what it was, there was always a fourth guy there to help them sort out their problems. Now that particular day, Joe Shea was supposed to be there and uh, for some reason, Joe couldn't be there. And so this astronaut, whoever he was, was in there helping him sort these problems out. And uh, in any book over there on Apollo that you read, the, the official story is that um, um, Walt, Walt Schirra met with uh, Joe Shea at lunch and said, you know, why don't you uh, hook up an extra fourth headset in there and, uh, and, and send somebody else in to go help them sort out their problems. And Joe Shea allegedly said, yeah, I think we'll try that out. And then the book goes on, each book goes on to say, it was too difficult to do, that they would have hang, had to hang wires out the hatch and they had to seal the hatch so they couldn't do it. And all that, of course, is bullshit. They had everything wired for a fourth astronaut in there just to, just for that specific purpose to help them sort through the problems. Mm -hmm. Now, um, you know, Chuck, um, um, what, not McClellan. Clark McClellan. What? Clark McClellan. Clark McClellan. And I have talked at this at length. And, you know, to this day, it hurts him to talk about it because it was so awful. But, um, you know, we've talked about what happened after that. And, uh, you know, and his feeling is, he's the one that told me, he said, uh, it was not a specific kill, but they, they let it happen. They let him die. And uh, th all. this one really hurts, Clark. Okay, about uh, a week ago, um, CNN said that a 220-mile uh, uh, by 40- uh, or 50-mile chunk of ice had broken off from Antarctica and that it just demonstrated uh, how serious global warming was coming, uh, becoming. And it had a, uh, a video taken by a British crew in a Twin Otter 
flying along this huge chunk of ice that was cut as straight as an arrow for 40 miles. And um, this was trying to be sold to us, the public, as something that had just broken off when it was obviously a direct energy weapon that had made all the square cuts uh, on this. And uh, they're using the weapons that they have, uh, the direct energy weapons, to do all kinds of, of stuff like that. Um, that one was to cut that piece of ice off so that we would um, worry about global warming, which, <clears throat> yes, there is global warming, but we had nothing to do with it. It's just a natural cycle of Earth that's going to go warm up for a while and then it'll cool off for an, a while. There's nothing we can do about it. Other things they have done with that, certainly, the Mura building in Oklahoma City was absolutely a direct energy weapon, no doubt about it. And I'm sure that Timothy McVeigh is alive and well now. He was part of the operation. There's no way that they'd let him die. Uh, that was a test for the direct energy weapon, which was predecessed for the 9-11. Uh, the Talking about the Atlas V mystery launch, uh, Atlas V is a missile that we, is one of our current missiles uh, that we use to launch all kinds of things into space. Um, this one was uh, launched uh, 24 hours after uh, Atlantis, uh, the uh, STS-122 was scrubbed at um, Kennedy Space Center. Patrick Air Force Base is right next to that. It's the military Cape Canaveral. And somehow they got this thing launched in 24 hours. And I'm just saying the importance of the story was something that was going to go up in Atlantis had to get up there and there was no delay in it. So they had to get the range ready and put these astronauts, I'm sure they were astronauts, it could have been cargo, but I'm sure the astronauts, in this Atlas V and launch it. Now the Atlas V, <clears throat> of course, has a huge um, payload as, on top and there could be anything in it. I've never seen what's in it. I assume there's a little spaceship in it and there are two or three astronauts get in it. When Atlas V goes up, it opens like that and that little spaceship goes out and can, man can maneuver between all the other space platforms we have and then it can uh, come back in and glide in and land. Uh, what's so suspicious about this is they got that thing into the air within 24 hours after Atlantis was scrubbed and the story they put out with it. And uh, later I'll show you the headlines of that story <clears throat> which made it so suspicious. Uh, one of the things I wanted to tell you about is that um, I've been driving between Las Vegas and Reno for maybe 30 years. My, mo my folks moved up there in 1968. I moved here in 1974. And about two-thirds of the way to the Reno, there's a nice little town called Hawthorne, Nevada. Uh, there's a nice little lake there. It's called Walker Lake. It's about 14 miles long, about 80 miles deep. It's a very picturesque little place, uh, right huddle, uh, huddled up against the mountains. Uh, there's two military operations there. One is an army uh, ammunition um, uh, fabrication where they make um, different types of um, uh, explosives, missiles, that type of stuff. That's on one side of the road. On the other side of the road is a place called NUWC, N -U -W -C, and that stands for the Naval Undersea Warfare Center. Now, Every time I go by there, I see that beautiful little sign that says Navy Undersea Warfare Center, and I realize we're about as far out in the middle of Nevada as you can possibly get. All there is is sand and mountains, uh, as far as you can see, and this little teeny lake. It couldn't possibly be used for undersea warfare uh, training because it's not that big. So I've always wondered, you can look down in there, and uh, it kind of slopes down towards the lake, and you see a couple of nondescript buildings, but, but nothing very interesting. <clears throat> so I've always wondered what that place is. Now, over the years uh, of flying for the different airlines that I've had, I've talked to three different people who have said there's a, a submarine base there. Now, I've always, you know, wondered, first of all, the submarines couldn't come up in Walker Lake. It just, it just can't happen. It's too shallow. There's, there's no way they could do that. And besides, there's a bottom to that, and they couldn't come up. So <clears throat> these people have been uh, very knowledgeable who have told me this, and uh, I've always wondered what, what the real deal was. So last August, I gave a talk at the <clears throat> San Jose UFO Expo West, and... Um, 
my topic was the civilization on the moon when I talked about the civilization on the moon. And after it, a Navy guy came up in full dress uniform and a young man and uh, thanked me for my talk. And uh, I said, um, uh, should you be here? And he said, oh yeah, no, no problem. And I said, great, um, uh, when were you last down uh, in the tubes? And he said, uh, or I said, have you been down in the tubes lately? And he said, every day. Now that's the key question you ask a Navy guy because you know the Navy has an underground tube system that goes all around the world and it's very, very fast. I think you can go anywhere in the world in an hour. And it's very secret, it's been operational you know, since the 60s. And everybody knows about it, but it's a big, big secret and it's a big Navy secret. I've known some really, you know, interesting and top-level Navy guys, and I've never found anybody that actually admitted being down there except this one guy. So when he did that, I said, you know, this guy's, this guy's in. He knows it. <clears throat> so I met with him later, and he told me a lot of interesting things. And well, what, what's the description of the tubes? When you say the tubes, you're, are you t you're talking about like? What, a high-speed train? Yeah, it's a high-speed train. It's about the diameter of this uh, room, and they have little cars that you get into, and you get lay like, kind of prone like this, and you pull the, the hood down there and go, and you're, you know, anywhere in the world in an hour. Oh, God. I talked to this guy, and uh, one of the things I said, you know, do you know anything about Hawthorne? And uh, <laughs> he said, no. He said, why? And I said, well, you know, there's a the Naval Under sea warfare center there oh yeah i know what you're talking about yeah i said um, the entrance is in uh, north of fort ord on monterey bay and he said there's a <laughs> the pacific ocean underlies california nevada and idaho and he said uh, that's that's the channel that goes from monterey bay to hawthorne and then there's an elevator at hawthorne that goes down 4300 feet because the altitude of hawthorne is 4,300 feet, and the and the elevator takes them down to sea level uh, under Hawthorne, and that's where that's why the army base is there, is because they make the the ordnance that goes into submarines, and that's why you never see or nobody's ever seen any ordnance laden trucks come out of Hawthorne either south or north. They don't. They go right down to the Pacific Ocean where the where the submarines go in, and they load up there, and they come out here. And um, there's also, now I know what a friend of mine was, uh, Scotty Lyon, SEAL Team 6, one of the original SEAL Team founders, a uh, great guy, passed away now. So now I can tell, he told me there was a secret Navy base in Lake Tahoe. He didn't tell me more than that, but now I see what everybody's talking about. There's underground uh, bases, uh, uh, naval bases, that connected by the Pacific Ocean that go all over. There's some up in Idaho. Uh, and who knows, you know, um, a few months ago on ATS, a guy said that his father worked on nuclear submarines in St. Louis, Missouri. So, you know, and he went down there and he saw the lake and everything. So my question was, did they come up the Mississippi or did they come eastbound uh, under, uh, in, the, in the Pacific Ocean to there? So then the question is, does it connect with the Atlantic? And it's very possible it does. Uh, two of the original uh, nuclear submarines that were lost by the Navy, uh, as you remember, uh, were the Thresher and the, and the uh, Scorpion. <clears throat> and both of them had uh, fantastic stories of, you know, a valve coming apart or attacking a Soviet submarine and uh, um, that kind of stuff. But if you go into the Branton Files and read about that story, uh, those subs were lost exploring this area here. Both of them, the Thresher and the Scorpion. And what was interesting is on ATS, when I first started to talk about this, they called in the big team from uh, <clears throat> the Pentagon. And this blowhard Navy guy comes in, you know, all huffy and huffy. And I hear somebody wants to talk about the Thresher or the Scorpion, you know, and I let him have it. And of course, he's gone the next day. You know, he didn't realize, you know, he thought he was going to, uh, you know, intimidate us there. Uh, that was really interesting. Now, <clears throat> one of the other things uh, I heard about was a computerized um, battleship. It's called Fleet 21, 
it exists. They just finished their sea trial southwest of Coronado. It's um, going into full operation now. It's 600 feet long, just exactly like any other battleship, except there's not one person on it. Uh, it's all computerized. Um, there's a helicopter landing pad on the back that if anything goes wrong, they bring in a team with nine members and they go down and they get to the computer room and they fix it and then take off. But what that allows us to do is make a com total uh, attacks with a battleship uh, with nobody uh, being hurt. Uh, the other thing I um, heard was we have what's called a fast attack submarine. Now the stuff that I'm telling you is technically not classified for this reason. Um, several years ago it was determined that the minute you classified something you had to do so much paperwork that it became unclassified. Too many people had to know about it. So the best thing was to do is not tell anybody about it except those people that knew about it. And, and and not classify it. And that way you could keep it more secret, if that makes any sense. Uh, this is a nuclear-powered fast Absolutely. attack submarine. Um, the interesting thing about this is, <clears throat> I believe it uses uh, um, fusion instead of fission. It's only 70 feet long. Imagine a nuclear source that could power that thing within that small space. <clears throat> this is a 12-man... Uh, SEAL Team Lockout. And this is the submarine. I think there's about 70 of them now. Uh, that's the one I believe that cut the cables because they can dive down deep enough, get down there and have their 12-man team go out there and do whatever they want with the cables. Uh, this thing is very highly advanced. It's 70 feet long, goes 120 knots, and has a nine-man crew. The ROV here stands for Remote Operator Vehicles. They're tucked in there, and there's three of them. One of them can fly. One of them can actually go up and fly around and take pictures or, or do whatever you want. Now, you look at the 20-knot speed and say, John Lear, now, come on. We know that um, planing and submerged hulls cannot possibly go that fast. Well, the fact is, now they've, sound, found, uh, or, or they've um, perfected, uh, solved boundary layer control. And boundary layer control is that portion of the sea that comes in contact with the ship and creates the friction. Is that similar that, to the technology they got on the wing of the B-2 bomber? Yeah. But applied to water? Submarines. Submarines. Submarine. I understand. And they make that, uh, and they make the stuff um, up in space uh, on our manufacturing plants. When the shuttle comes back and when other airplanes, I'll show you another copy of an, or picture of an airplane here that was seen over Ireland a couple of years ago um, come back they're bringing parts and they bring it back in sheets rolled and bars and it's a stuff that's fantastic and you can do all kinds of stuff but what the most important thing you can do like on submarines it keeps the boundary layer that layer between the um, hull and the sea about uh, three to five centimeters away so there's absolutely no friction nor is there any noise associated with that so they use that not only on their new battleships but on their submarines and on their airplanes it's a really really fantastic piece of uh, material so that's how they can go 120 knots we know <clears throat> that the uh, displacement hull of a boat like say the ronald reagan uh, the theoretical max speed is uh, 1.34 times the water line. So we know the water line of the uh, Ronald Reagan is about 1,000 feet. So you take 1.4 times the square root of that, and you come out with about 32 knots. And that sounds reasonable to most people. Uh, you know, an aircraft carrier going 32 knots, man, that, that's really hauling. The fact is, I think the Ronald Reagan goes about 90 knots. The reason I think that is because the Enterprise definitely went 75 knots. I have uh, friends that operated on that and they said that whenever they had to go somewhere, go someplace fast, they would tell everybody to get below decks, you know, because the weather was coming and then they get it up to 75 knots. The reason they did that is number one, they didn't want to be anybody figuring out how fast they went um, and they didn't want it to get them blown off deck because 75 knots is really rolling. That's almost 90 miles an hour and you don't want anybody trying to walk across the deck when they're used to just maybe walking around in 30 knots. And then when you say, well, when they got there, wouldn't they ask any questions? No. The fact is nobody asked any questions. 
Um, TWA 800 was shot down by a Navy submarine. Uh, it's been kept under wraps like that. Uh, I often hear people say, um, uh, well, that's not possible because we know that Navy uh, guys are the most talkative in the world and certainly somebody would talk. That's not true. Navy is one of the closest knit forces uh, in the world. Uh, nobody says nothing unless they're supposed to. And uh, there's no possible way that anybody on that submarine would have ever told anything. Um, yes, one person did call his dad and that uh, person called Jim Sanders who wrote the down, downing of flight TWA, but that was 800, but that was the only one that, that, that said anything. Um, Which missile was it? That I don't know, it was one that was aimed at a drone. And when they launched it, the drone was between TWA 800 and the submarine. And for some reason, when the drone, uh, when the um, missile was launched, it lost instantaneous, just for an instant, a lock on the drone. And when it reacquired a lock, it reacquired TW800. And when it went through TW800, it went through first class, you know, knocked the nose off and caused the center tank, you know, to explode. Um, so you're saying it was an accident? It was an accident. It was a Navy accident. They were just using it for live fire exercises, and they had done right. that forever. And that was the fifth airplane, the civilian airliner, that the Navy had shot down since 1963. The first one was Flying Tiger Line, who I worked for, a, TW, or a, a Lockheed Constellation over Guam, where a Navy pilot went up and he was just doing some, you know, aiming at the at the um, airliner going by because he had nothing else to aim at and it accidentally let a missile go and it shot down, killed everybody on board. And um, uh, it, that accident was always, you know, unknown causes, but it caused Flying Tiger Lines uh, to be the largest cargo carrier during the Vietnam War and the Pentagon to authorize a separate Flying Tiger airline, which was called Flying Tiger Air, air Services, to run the uh, extra flights down from Japan down to Vietnam. I mean, Flying Tigers made a fortune off that accident. Yeah. And I was in close right. time. So, uh, just before I lose the point, I'd like to compare the testimony here because we were told by Henry Deacon, now he actually asked us to take this off our website because he was curious about what had happened to TWA 800. So when he was on the inside, he asked, a, he asked around. He said it was a Stinger missile. It aimed exactly at the drone and just missed. It's exactly the way he said it was a Navy, genuine accident. He said the whole thing was covered up. He said the thing was at, right at the top of its classified altitude um, limit, which is higher than it's publicized, about 14,000 feet. Or that's possible because it's, but, it's, it's publicized as 8,000 feet, and that's yeah. why all of us canceled the Stinger out. Yeah. Is it possible that a Stinger will be fired from a submarine? I thought a Stinger was handheld. No, I think the Stinger story and its classified altitude is maybe we're trying to make it like uh, um, terrorists fired it or, instead of the Navy. We would rather have terrorists yeah. fired instead of our Navy because our Navy just shot down the Uranian ship, yeah. so why did they shoot down? What Henry said was that it was a Stinger, but it was a Navy okay. accident. It could have been. And Whatever it was, it was Navy. Was, I doubt if a Stinger would be fi fired from a Navy vessel. Mm -hmm. There's too much evidence that the Navy did it. They did it, and I doubt if they did it with a Stinger. Okay. Uh, Stinger has an explosive on it, and there were no explosives uh, in TW-800. Uh, there was only the, the fuel which uh, which damaged anything, and that's, that's for the record. Okay. Uh, Sanders did an excellent thing on that. But anyway, um, <clears throat> so that was uh, TW-800, and it affected me directly because what the FAA came up with, an excuse, and, you know, this is all Richard Clark's fault, uh, you know, trying to blame it on uh, center tank um, um, exposed wiring in a, in a fuel pump. That's so impossible, I cannot even tell you. During the time of this investigation, I was flying Lockheed L-1011, which was a huge cargo airplane. It had a mammoth cargo door, and I was taking Boeing 777 uh, cowlings uh, from Wichita, where they were made at Boeing, to Seattle. and. Uh, when we'd sit, uh, when we'd wait for this thing to be loading, and we'd talk with the Boeing guys, they were just furious that uh, that the FAA and the NTSB were trying to lay this on uh, arc arcing wiring of a fuel pump because there is no wiring in, in, in a fuel pump that that's uh, that's that's anywhere near fuel. It was just ridiculous, and everybody was pissed off about the whole thing. I was pissed off because the FAA then said. <clears throat> 
that uh, you had to keep enough fuel to cover the fuel pump um, uh, so that it wouldn't arc. Because, you know, if there's fuel there, it can't arc. It's only if there's fumes there will it arc. Well, in the L-1011, uh, we had about 115,000 pounds of uh, cargo capacity. And if we kept the center tank fuel pump covered, we lost about two or 3,000 pounds. And that was the make or break and it eventually bankrupted Kitty Hawk, who I was working for. <clears throat> but anyway... But I, I want to ask you a question. Did you know Ben Rich? No. But no. I talked to people who did. Now, I'll tell you what Ben Rich had to do with this. First of all, do you know where he was born? Ben Rich was one of the most... Class, what, the, the, the biggest Mossad spy in the United States. I mean, he got the most classified information. Here's what happened. Here's how we got messed up with it, Israel. In 1947, when Israel became a state, um, uh, Jim, um, uh, I keep saying Anslinger, it's not Anslinger, James uh, Angleton was uh, chief of uh, CIA in, right. uh, in Rome. Okay. They sent Angleton down to Tel Aviv, along with some guys at MI6, to form Mossad. And for some reason, whoever, however it happened, uh, James Angleton got allied with, M, uh, with Mossad like this forever. He was the mole. If you remember in 1960, he was the head CIA director of foreign intelligence and he was the guy that always was looking for the russian mole he was the russian mole because you know he was so friends with Mossad, he'd tell Mossad stuff and Mossad would pass it on to russia so when um uh, david van gurian in the summer of uh, 1963 said uh you know we have to kill kennedy we, we have to i'm tired of you threatening us with uh, inspecting Demona. It's none of his friggin' business. I don't want to hear any more from Kennedy. You kill him. He gave that, he gave that order to Mossad and then resigned so that he couldn't, he couldn't be held responsible for it. Mossad then went to Angleton. Uh, the Kennedy assassination was not a CIA job, but it was greased by the CIA only because Angleton was in there with his buddies at Mossad. And he's the one that greased the skids for everything that happened in Dealey Plaza and the escape and everything. They were uh, Corsican sharpshooters there, hired by Mossad. Uh, they pulled off the whole thing and everybody says, well, you know, they think the mob killed Kennedy or maybe Johnson did or, you know, the, you know, Castro. It wasn't. It was Israel. And the reason they did is because David Ben-Gurion didn't want any more inspections of Demona. And that's all. And that's their, their nuclear, it's where they do their nuclear That's where they built their nuclear bombs with, with plutonium they stole from us uh -huh. and, uh, and other but things. But what's Ben Rich got to do with that? Okay, so Ben Rich was uh, born with a very wealthy Jewish family in the Philippines and a very highly educated, and he was slipped into Lockheed in 1953 as, a, uh, 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 as um, Kelly Johnson's uh, second in charge. <clears throat> and he was there for the development of the U-2, and he was there for um, the development of um, uh, stealth. You know, that, the, there are a lot of Ben Rich famous kind of UFO quotes that kind of allude to things that technology, right? Right. Yeah. There's nothing of that in that book. That book's the inside story of the development of the U-2. I understand. Um, and the SR-71. But he, he did say, he, he said, what's the exact quote? You probably remember it. Um, we have stuff that would make uh, Star George Lucas Wars. jealous. That would, that would make we could take E.T. home. Yeah. Yeah, so I mean, he was he was an insider from way back, is what you're telling me. Right? Yeah, but he was his mom's side spy, and I'm gonna tell you how they did it. Okay, now, but so. But on some level, if he's a Mossad spy, because the Mossad seems to be in cahoots with, if you want to call them, you know, the Nazi, NASA Nazi group. I'm glad you understand that, because when people say, did Israel have anything to do with 9 11? I said, as much as Santa Claus had to do with Christmas. <laughs> So, so anyway, so yeah, they're all working together. If you're telling me Angleton was was involved with Mossad, you're telling me Ben Rich is involved with Mossad. You know, we've got 
we've got the whole there's the, there's a whole alignment there absolutely positively beyond a shadow of a doubt so now we get ready to uh, to build the stealth fighter and uh, what this was the beginning of the real secret stuff that went on within our government uh, the Navy and uh, wanted a uh, secret um, stealth fighter of their own. It was called the F-19. And it gets confused here because people say, oh, the F-19, that was really 117A, they just renamed it. No, no. The F-19 was a separate airplane. They made 62 of them. I had a friend that not only worked in avionics, but I had a friend that knew about it. He didn't fly it, but he knew the guys he did. So it was a completely separate airplane. At the Skunk Works in Burbank, there was a Grig iron uh, kind of a curtain that went down at the Skunk Works. And you had the 117A on this side and the F-19A on this side. They used both F-404s, the engines. They used both uh, the same landing gear. And the reason was is they were trying to build this secret Navy airplane without any money <coughs> using spare parts from the uh, F-117A so that they keep it absolutely totally secret and you know what they have to this day because you can't find a person and that's one of the big problems I had on ATS people would come down on me I'd start talking about the F-19 and boy I'll tell you you talk about a sensitive subject they didn't want to hear that so here we have Ben Rich on page uh, 48 talking about the skunk works and how it works and he says Meanwhile, the Navy came to us to test the feasibility for stealthy weapon system and set up their own top secret security system that was twice as stringent as the Air Force's. We had to install special alarm systems that cost us a fortune at the section of our headquarters building devoted to naval work. Okay, now here's a setup. <laughs> all they wanted was stealthy systems. Okay, in the next paragraph he says, in the midst of all this inter-service rivalry, rivalry, security, and hustle and bustle, Major General Bobby Bonds, who was in charge of tactical or, uh, warfare, came thundering into the skunk works with blood in his eye on a boiling September morning. The Santa Ana winds were howling, and half of L.A. was under a thick pall of smoke. My asthma was uh, acting up, and uh, I was no, in no mood for a visit. But General Bond was a brooder and warrior and drove me and everybody else absolutely bonkers at the time as he, as he followed the progress of the F-117A. He always thought he was being short, shortchanged or victimized in some way. He pounded on my desk and accused me of having some of my best workers of his half blue airplane, which was the 117A, to work on some rumored Navy project. I did my best to look hurt and appease Bobby uh, and even raised my right hand in a solemn oath. I told myself, so what? It's a little white lie. What else can I do? The Navy project is top secret and Bond has no need to know. We could both go to jail if I told him what was really up. So here he says, unfortunately, on the way out to lunch, the general spotted a special lock and alarm system above an unmarked door, which he knew from prowling the rings of the Pentagon was used only by the Navy on its top secret projects. Bond squeezed my arm. What's going on inside that door? He demanded to know. Before I could think up another lie, he commanded me to open the door. He said, Rich, you devious bastard, I'm giving you a direct order. Open the goddamn door of this incident or I'll smash it down myself with this goddamn fire axe. The guy meant every word of it. He began pounding on the door until a crack finally <laughs> opened. He forced his way and there sat a few startled Navy commanders. Bobby, this isn't what you think, I lied in vain. The hell it isn't, you lying SOB. <laughs> I surrendered, but not gracefully. Okay, you got me. But before we go to lunch, you're going to have to sign an inadvertent disclosure form or we'll both have our asses. The Navy, of course, was outraged at both of us. The Air Force General, seeing their secret project, uh, was as, uh, uh, as bad as having a blueprint for the Russians. Okay, so. <laughs> and that's the F-19. You've got an artist impression of on the wall over there, isn't it? The what? Yeah, at the, at the end. The artists Those are artists running around. Beautiful plane. Okay, now see this little thing at the bottom of the page? It says, General Bond was later killed in a test flight. Because of the tragedy, the Pentagon ruled that general officers could no longer do fl test flights. That was in 1984. You know what he was killed in? The story was a MiG-23, which we all knew was bullshit. He was killed in an F-19 because he demanded the Navy let him fly it. And what they did is this, they disabled, um, electronically disabled the control system and uh, killed him. 
And the reason they did is they didn't want the Air Force to know about the Navy project. And the reason they didn't want them to know about the Navy project is that part of those airplanes were going to carriers and part were going to Israel. And that's the story of Ben Rich. Are you saying that Israel had or has the F-19? F-19, yeah. I mean, it's tw it's 25 years old. I mean, it's a big deal. Israel has, does Santa Claus have Christmas? <laughs> <laughs> Great uh, stuff. Okay. Yeah. Oh, I want to ask you something, something else also. Um, the guy, the general who, who Bush just fired, or whatever you want to call Admiral him. Admiral Bill Fallon, I've got a... I've got a whole, I've got Esquire story. When I heard that, I went Incredible right down story, to Esquire. Right? I went right down to the borders and I bought the thing I brought home and I went right. word for word. <laughs> I mean, you talk about a good guy. Okay, you know. yeah, absolutely. Oh, absolutely. I made Merrily read that. I said, you read that because that's the difference between war and not war. Yeah, I said, if absolutely. there isn't any Navy good guys, he's the Navy good guy. Now, yeah. You know, he's been a lot involved in a lot of bad stuff. He knows about the, he knows about everything. But he was trying to do a good job. Yeah. So that that was a. So bad that's a real red herring, right? Yes. So so we're on we're not we're on a fast train somewhere right now. That's bad news that he quit. I mean, or, or is that just his way of? He wasn't. Make, he didn't quit. He, he was fired, wasn't he? Fired? No, he quit. No, well, he quit. The story. No, but I mean, I'm, I, I know the story. They probably he probably knew it was coming. But the fact that he would actually say this in Esquire magazine, you know, two or three months before, knowing it was going to be published now, you know, tells me he knows we are fast tracking, you know, a new oh, yeah. war in Iran, and there will be no war there without nuclear bombs. That that's that's a given. And what would Mike McConnell's position be on this? Mike McConnell, I'm sure, you know, he was MJ one. I think he's a good guy. We've clued him in on our quit him. Uh, complaint because I think he can help. Uh, what he's doing now doesn't make any sense to the overall program, but you know, I don't know. I'm just I'm just hoping Mike is a good guy. What do you think? We believe he's a good guy, and it's interesting. Well, you know, it's I mean, you know about his complete tie-in with that, right? Well, yeah. Oh yeah, absolutely. It's interesting to speculate okay. that the reason for the release of the national intelligence estimate in early December was despite Bush's guns, because that's what it looks like. There was right. an attempt right. to stop the war. And because of his tie-in with Dan, I think he's a good guy. And, right. Uh, yeah, that's basically what we think, but because of what we've heard from Dan about him. Um, you know. So what I've told the guys in the quit M complaint, Jerry Leapart is the attorney. Uh, Morgan Reynolds filed it. Judy Wood filed her own separate suit. She's the one that's the expert in molecular disassociation, DEWs. Um, there's a few people participating, including myself. And, you know, I told these guys when, um, I've been following along Morgan's efforts. And in November, I called him to make him aware of certain things I knew about airplanes that he didn't know about. And he, he said, are you the aviation guy? And I said, yeah. And so we started an email dialogue. And then in December, uh, he was going to take over Jim Fetzer's program for a couple of uh, days and said, would you like to be interviewed? And I, yeah, I said, sure. So I went on there and then he found out just how much else I knew about 9-11. And then a couple of days after that, he and Jerry emailed me and they said, you know, we're honored at, at uh, what you said. We believe, you know, you're uh, very informed. Would you uh, agree to help us? Would you be interested in filing an affidavit? And I said, yeah, tell me what you want. So I wrote that 15 page affidavit. And, That's um, great stuff and been with them ever since. But when I was getting into it, I said, now I want you guys to understand this. There is no way we're gonna pull this off by ourselves. All we're doing is opening the door for somebody to help us. There's no way we can bring this. There's just too much power overhead. I'm hoping that there's guys like McConnell and Fallon that will see what they're doing and figure out a way to help us because we're not going to do it ourselves. Okay, do you believe the, that America is going to dissolve into civil war sometime in the next few years? I don't think so. You don't? Okay. Well, what do you think, I mean, what do you think of the fact that a lot of stuff, a lot of government stuff is being being sent to Colorado? It I could mean, be some Colorado say or it could be... Denver is basically, you know, that that, I don't know, the Pentagon, everything else is moving to Colorado. I think it's Sandia, but I think Colorado is a cover story, but I could be wrong. I think it's all be sent right up there. Matter of fact, let me undo this. 20 years ago, 
um, they were having trouble with keeping uh, programs secret by using secret names. So what they did is they would name a program a name that was common, like the Sandia Mountains, Sandia Corporation, this you know the Sandia Desert, all that, and call this Sandia. So if it ever came up, everybody would would think, oh, you're just talking about Sandia Corporation. I drove by there the other day, you know. <laughs> but but no, that's the way they keep. It. Here's the spaceport on the far side of the moon, and I can just show you a NASA book with a NASA photograph, and you can just take your own magnifying glass and see that spaceport. There's no doubt about it. And you know why? Because the photo was taken in 68, and uh, NASA didn't get serious about airbrushing until 1970. So I bought all those pre-1970 NASA photos, um, no, books, because they hadn't uh, developed Really? Have you ever told Hoagland about that? Yeah, as a matter of fact, we were on the George Norris show, and George showed him that. And he said, uh, I said, now, does that look like a uh, um, space uh, terminal to you, uh, Richard? And he said, no, it looks like an airline terminal. <laughs> <laughs> well, look, you can see this, the, the tubes, the tube yeah. supports. I mean, there's no doubt about it. Now, here's the, the other thing. Here's a crater called Demozo. <laughs> there is no doubt, you know, that areas like that, those are all... Those are all houses, buildings, stuff like that. I mean, there's just no doubt. Hmm. So anyway, the other day I thought, you know, I'd just like to see. I've got this photo that was taken by Lick. And uh, so I got the other day, and I was going to enlarge it to see if I could see that. So I take this, this photo here. And I say, okay, it's right near here, good Sandy. And I look, it's all whited out. Look at here's the beautiful fucking craters. And you look at that spot, are there any craters? No, it looks like there's a fog. You're talking about something that really pissed me off. So anyway, I'm looking to see, uh, to show you Sandy. And let me... Yeah, please do. Best map. Here's Las Vegas. Right. Here's Grim Lake. Here's the Tonopah Test Range. Right. And here's Sandy. It's on the Paiute Mesa. There's a strip up there, and then there's two new strips out on the on the dry lake there. And then up here they got a really neat secret base, uh, Ely. See, here's Wilson Creek, Lincoln, Pioch, oh, Ely, right out here. There, that's a dry lake there. And well, that's, that's a, in the middle of nowhere. That's a 10,000 foot strip there. That's a really secret one. Um, you can drive by at 2 o'clock in the morning and every once you'll, you'll see the, the lights go on now. Um, the way you can tell secret bases yeah. is the runway lights are blue. <laughs> That's the Air Force. Really? But but they really have, they've got Why are these, they blue? What's that what's the significance of blue? That's just what the Air Force secret base run lights are, blue. So they've got this new deal here that's been in effect for like twenty years. Most of these things are underground and when a pilot comes for an approach, only when he gets to be about uh, five hundred feet the ground unzips like that. Oh and wow. Run, you can, it just lands, and the ground could be forest, it could be a desert, it could be a cotton field. It just unzips like that. He lands, it zips back up, and then take an elevator and go down. And wow, that's great. So that's Sandia, and that's why it's called Sandia, is to uh, make people think that it's just a regular place. So you you haven't had any exposure to to uh, to time travel to jump rooms to no I the jump room is great and uh, the other day Ron Blackburn was over here because he gave my six year old a uh, computer and and I'll have to think about whether we should edit this out or not but I was talking of, about jump room and Ron said oh yeah I know that it's jump 
jump te technology. He said it just like that. Oh, that jump technology, I know that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, here's the, uh, this is the, the space plane that the guy saw over Ireland. Uh, wow. It was 10 times bigger than a Boeing 747. Incredible. Uh, twin tails slightly visible. Engine bay, jet black, no nozzles. So you've Thick. never seen anything like that, have you? No. Yeah. Uh, he saw it at sunset. He said sun angle very low, almost setting. Uh, viewed at directly 7 o'clock, directly above, and it took 7 seconds to get to the horizon. He said disappeared over Belfast out of uh, uh, sunlight. A white small nose and no vapor trail no sonic boom uh, demarcation of body sections visible all dark gray and I had some correspondence with this guy oh you did just yeah just a just a couple of months back and we figured things out together the thing must have been going 18,000 miles per hour Miles Johnson yeah that's correct that's uh, these are his original yeah. drawings and oh, I, wow. took a, I, and I well, made that, but when he first called me, he said, would you have any interest in this? I said, of course, Miles, send it, send it. He said, well, now, you know what, what I did, John, was I put him in touch with Mark McCandlish so that Mark McCandlish could make a real professional drawing yeah. thing. And so the two have been working together so that Mark can add it to his file. And uh, so those two have been having a lot of fun. If I had one planet I could go to, I'd pick Saturn, because they say that it, if you even got a look at it, your mind would be so boggled that you couldn't, couldn't do anything for three days. I found a thread called, <clears throat> um, Are Extraterrestrials Real? As Real as the Nose on Your Face? And uh, it was 108 pages long and it had, been, it had been closed. And it had been closed because the guy, Sleeper, had uh, been getting irritated with the uh, questioners. So I started reading this thing, and about page 18, I said, this is real. This guy knows what he's talking about. This fits in with everything I've ever read. I need to talk to this guy. <clears throat> so I finished the uh, 118 pages, and I put them in that book over there that says uh, Sleeper. And I, I emailed him, PM'd him, and eventually got to talking with him. And it was so fascinating. I said, would you be, uh, would you like to come, would you mind coming back? I mean, there's, people got to hear this stuff. And he said, no, no, I, I'll come back. And I said, okay, now just let me run interference for you. Don't talk back to anybody, let me do it. So I went to uh, Mark Allen and I said, I'd like to see if we could get Sleeper back. He said, well, he better behave himself. I said, okay, he'll behave himself. And that started the, um, I'm coming clean on extraterrestrials and ran, ran 250 pages. He had the most views, the most posts of any other thing. It was, I mean, it was just an enjoyable, everybody would get up every day to see what the, the question, <laughs> you know, the answers were to the, some of the questions. So is and the stuff up there still? What? Is the stuff still up there? Yeah, I believe so. And uh, he, and, uh, <clears throat> you know, people, it eventually got the very few insults. Of course, you know, you're always getting the guy that came, comes on and says, this looks like a whole little horse pucky to me, you know, and I'd handle it. I'd always get on there first thing in the morning and handle the guys, and so mm -hmm. Sleeper wouldn't have to do it. It was great up until the very end. I mean, even at the very end, it, it was it was, it was, was wonderful, and we had a, a lot of fun with it. Huh. <clears throat> and then along with that, he wrote a blog called um, What It's Like to Spend a Day with an Extraterrestrial, and it's the most fascinating space story you've ever read and he says at the beginning he said um, I forget what exactly what he says he says um, this is written as a screenplay but believe it or not every word of it is true and it's about going to Uranus and the people who live on Uranus and what the buildings look like it's, it's absolutely fascinating so Great. I Have think sleeper a is a hundred and ten percent genuine and you know if it proves he's not I'll be shocked beyond all possible belief because, you know, everything he says is dead on. And, you know, when I talk about, you know, and he's taught me a lot of stuff because, you know, when in the last few years and people ask me, well, what's it all about? And, well, I don't know, maybe the grazers are selling our souls or, you know, doing the harvesting us. You know, I was wrong, you know. 
they're here to do a job. And Sleeper's the one that, that told us, and he puts us all throughout. He says, just try and live your life without envy, hate, and greed, and love your family. He says, that's the only way you're going to move on, and you have to keep coming back to Earth, you know, and doing this until you learn how to do it right. And when you learn how to do it right, then you get to go out and play with the adults. So, <clears throat> Sleeper is the one that, uh, you know, and when I started to talk, it was really interesting to see the gentle transformation because, you know, in the beginning he says, um, uh, people would say, uh, is John Lear right? Are there, is there cities, on, people on the moon? And he says, no, no, there's nobody up there. And at the end, um, he said, uh, yeah, John Lear's right. There are cities and people on the moon. It was really neat transformation. It took uh, a while to do but for him to come out, but it was really great. cool.